Andy, really appreciate you joining us on Voices of Wall Street. Fuel cell and hydrogen technology are subjects that are very important to younger investors over on Wall Street. So let's start off by giving us a quick interview of what Plug Power does and how it is utilizing hydrogen fuel cell power to capitalize on the shift to electric vehicles and sustainable energy. Sure. So Catherine, we've been doing this a long time. I've been doing it for 12 years. The company's been at it for about 25 years. And about 10 years ago, we decided to focus at that time at putting fuel cells in the forklift truck. Doesn't sound all that exciting, but it really helped us learn how to develop a wide range of capabilities. We've built, you know, just to give you a feel, we built 113 fueling stations because we had to figure out a way to put hydrogen into those fuel cells in the forklift trucks. We've deployed over 40,000 units. And last year we became the leading provider, leading user of hydrogen in the world as a fuel. So uh, that's really given us the capability to move into a wide range of applications from on-road vehicles uh, to large scale backup power systems to all sorts of cool items. Uh, we also build electrolyzers, which take you know, green electricity to create hydrogen. So uh, a lot of capability in plug power. And you know, why I'm still working is because what we're doing is really important for everybody's future. And as you mentioned, I mean, it does have such wide availabilities. You have really impressive customers. I mean, you got Amazon, you've got Walmart, and they rely on you for material handling solutions such as forklifts, which you alluded to. So tell us about how you work with Amazon and Walmart and what the plans are to extend those relationships. Sure. So just to give you a feel, and let's uh, start with food distribution. So during COVID here, more than 30% of the retail food in the United States actually touched the hydrogen powered forklift truck, uh, which was provided by Plug Power. So we started working with Amazon and we started working with Walmart, oh, I bet 15 years ago. And we went everywhere from, you know, we started out by deploying 10 units to 60 units uh, till today that we have over 10,000 units at Walmart and talking to them about expanding well beyond material handling to doing vehicles on road uh, to also providing backup power solutions where diesel generators are used today. So, uh, you know, we work with our customers, you know, many of our customers have sustainability goals, but they also want to be cost effective. And, you know, you don't sell to Walmart unless you know how to bring costs down. And uh, they've taught us a lot. And, uh, we have good partnerships and relationships up and down the organization who really do understand the value fuel cells bring to their operations, but also how it lets Walmart offer a cleaner, greener solution uh, for their customers. I want to talk specifically about growth initiatives in on-road vehicles. How is Plug Power approaching the opportunity in delivery vans, long haul trucking, and, and even air travel for that matter? Yeah, so uh, let's start with the, the easy one. Uh, air is exciting and uh, we'll talk, I'll, I'll touch on that last, but there's actually two vehicles to market. One is uh, working with uh, uh, integrators and OEMs to put our standard fuel cell box, uh, which is a lot like a battery. You know, you can buy this box, plug it into a traditional EV and you can have a fuel cell EV. So it's really, really simple. But we're also talking about partnerships with large uh, OEMs who actually develop vehicles with them, which are based on fuel cell technology. And then you may wanna ask your question, why wouldn't you just use a battery? And it really comes down to fuel cells in mobility, Catherine, make a lot of sense for business vehicles. If you have to carry a lot of goods, because fuel cells are lighter than batteries. They have, they're smaller than batteries. And when you talk to someone like DHL, they think about a battery electric vehicle that deliver packages. It's probably good for about a hundred miles. Or if it goes longer than that, the batteries take up all the storage space. 
and DHL delivers packages. So fuel cells are so much smaller, can go three times longer before they have to be recharged, can recharge in minutes. And that's really why fuel cells make a great deal of sense for on-road vehicles. And then air travel? Oh, air travel, which is a real fun one. So, uh, you know, your listeners may not know, but air travel is two and a half percent of the global carbon CO2 that gets emitted. So reducing uh, air travel is really, reducing CO2 for air travel, really important. And we're working with a company called Universal Hydrogen, uh, which actually uh, old people from Airbus and UTC in the aerospace developed the company. And in 2024, we expect to be doing flights for regional airlines. Now you live in Austin and I used to take Southwest from Dallas to Austin all the time. And that kind of airline, essentially you would change it to electric drivetrains, which are quiet and smoother. And you would just roll on hydrogen, connect it. And for the next flight, do the same thing. So it uh, will be uh, developing the fuel cells for that product, as well as delivering the green hydrogen. So we've talked about on road and air, but what other adjacent markets offer the biggest opportunity for you guys? Okay, so when I look at the world, um, so adjacent markets, and I'm gonna say, it's actually in the hydrogen generation space. And uh, you know, Europe, and Europe, for example, has a commitment to deploy 80 gigawatts of electrolyzers between Europe and Northern Africa by 2030. And you know, Plug Power is a leader in, the, in, in building and designing electrolyzer systems. That market alone uh, can dwarf all the other markets, quite honestly, we're, we're, we're involved in today. So, uh, so, so electrolyzers take renewable wind. Uh, so you, you know, we talked earlier, you're in Texas. Texas actually has a problem. They have too much renewable. Uh, because it makes the grid unstable. You put an electrolyzer off that grid, actually during the night in West Texas when the wind's blowing, you can be generating hydrogen when people don't want electricity. And that's what, electri- and that's what electrolyzers can do for you. They're a wonderful device to take renewable electricity, create green hydrogen. It can go into mobility. It can go into heating. A lot of industrial heating applications I mean, we've been talking about mobility, but the carbon footprint for things like steel manufacturing, cement manufacturing is 26% of the world's carbon footprint and electrolyzers can help solve that problem. So uh, there's also opportunities for heating homes. Uh, In the UK, National Grid is looking to change their natural gas pipeline by 2040 into a hydrogen pipeline using wind off the North Sea, converting it to uh, hydrogen via electrolysis and going right into the pipeline. And there's work going on all around the world. In the United States, SoCal Gas is beginning to uh, work on projects to do exactly that. It's interesting because, I mean, what you've been talking about and also your partnerships with with companies such as Amazon and Walmart, hydrogen really has been captured by the commercial space, but I'm not really seeing that translate yet into the consumer space. So I'm almost wondering what the biggest hurdle is for you guys to get to the consumer. So, uh, Catherine, this pro- applicate products today are actually best for the business space. Uh, you know, when I look at the world, and the world, uh, I never say one technology is best for everything. I think battery electric vehicles are right for many consumers. You know, a normal car is driven 4% of the time. Batteries can solve a lot of those needs. Uh, fuel cells are really meant today for acid intense applications. And then if you want to go to long distance flights, biofuels make a lot more sense. But when you think about fuel cells post 2030, let's take the state of California, for example, only about 15% of consumers actually can charge cars at their homes. I mean, I live in a condo. 
I have no way to charge a car. So a fuel cell electric vehicle will be a perfect fit for many consumers who don't have the infrastructure in place. And as costs come down, it becomes more and more attractive. And there are fuel cell vehicles on the road. Every, about every month, another thousand go on the road in South Korea. There's uh, almost 10,000 on the road in California. Uh, the, ta the taxi cab fleet in Paris is actually fuel cell electric. And that's probably the first consumer interface that you'll see is in the taxi world. And if you dream about uh, 2035, 2040, vehicles being a sharing economy and vehicles and cars being on the road 50, 60% of the time, the only solution because of fast fueling and longer range will be fuel cells. So hydrogen definitely has its its fair share of doubters and Elon Musk is among them. I mean, the Tesla CEO. So what are the critics getting wrong from what you just said? It sounds very positive, especially for cars. Well, you know, it's funny. And by the way, I have great respect for Elon Musk. And if you look at Plug's business model, there's a lot about our business model that looks a lot like SpaceX and Tesla. We're vertically integrated like SpaceX and we do many, many things ourselves. And we build the fueling stations like uh, Tesla did to make sure that there was ways for customers to charge. Uh, but I think that, uh, you know, if you went to Asia, uh, the world is actually different. Uh, you go into China, you go into Japan, uh, they're not actually looking at Elon Musk as the answer. They actually look at people like Toyota and Honda as the answer, who are huge promoters of hydrogen vehicles. So whenever the 2020 Olympics goes, and hopefully it's in 2021, it actually will be a hydrogen fuel cell Olympics. Um, I think, uh, quite honestly, I think sometimes people get committed to, I believe in this, uh, Life isn't usually that black and white. And I can tell you the reasons I gave you is why many countries, uh, the European Union, for example, expects to put 20% of their uh, recovery money to go towards hydrogen economy. So uh, I understand doubters, uh, but there's also a lot of uh, folks who believe it is the solution. You gave us a timeline of maybe 2030 to see some cars with um, hydrogen, powered by hydrogen. But I, why has adoption been so slow? I mean, that's still about nine years out. Well, I, I think I actually said, Catherine, that there's vehicles on the road today. But it's actually because, uh, you know, we talked about use cases. And, you know, the use case for hydrogen fuel cells, both from a performance and cost Spaces makes most sense for business to business today. There'll be millions of hydrogen cars by 2030, but that's a small number versus what it will be long term. And you know, you look at China, for example, they're projecting just there there'll be a million hydrogen vehicles on the road, uh, which are passenger vehicles. So uh, you know, I I guess it's uh, to me it's not a long time, uh, but uh, you know. I worked in a uh, wireless in 1982, and uh, it wasn't until 1994 to 1995 that everybody had began to have cell phones. So some of these things, the adoption rates uh, uh, are uh, first go on in certain markets, then it moved to others. And that's kind of what you're seeing in hydrogen too. How but, look, uh, but look, uh, you look at what uh, folks like uh, Goldman Sachs are saying and Bank of America, they think this is going to be over a $10 trillion market. Pretty big market. And that market, I mean, how dependent is it going to be on government spending and initiatives? You know, we built the hydrogen fuel cell market for vehicles um, with minimum government, with, for forklift trucks with minimum government support. So there's two aspects of it. One is the generation of hydrogen. And the generation of hydrogen via electrolysis 
is really tied to the cost of renewable power. And as most of your listeners know, in many places that you know, deals are being done under two cents a kilowatt hour. And at those kind of prices, hydrogen that's green is very, very cost competitive today with hydrogen that comes from natural gas. So you know how to get the fuel. When you think about hardware, uh, plug every time we double the number of units in the field, costs come down by about 25%. That's a very typical hardware model. Uh, you know, I've been in hardware most of my life. So I think, you know, you see the cost trajectory on both that uh, by 2028, 20, 2029, 20, uh, people think a fuel cell uh, vehicle for on the road will be cost comparative to uh, a battery electric vehicle. Now you guys have a gigafactory in the works and I'm wondering how is that going to accelerate growth for you guys? Well, it's gonna do two things. Uh, as we become more and more automated, uh, it allows you the ability to reduce your costs. So costs will be coming down. On the second item, to sell more products, you gotta be able to make more products too. And we know the demands there for electrolyzers. We know the demands there for fuel cells. So we're building a factory today that'll support our needs through 2024. And can you give us any hints about where this gigafactory is going to be? Do you have like a top three locations? <laughs> Good question, Catherine. Um, you know, I, I would just say this. I think there's been talk in the press about Ohio. I think there's been talk in the press about New York. 